We've got recruiting news. We've got a look around the Coastal Division and the rest of the country. And we have everything you need to get ready for Pitt, Tennessee tomorrow at Akershore Stadium, 3.30 kickoff. Today, this is the morning pit right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. You know, we do this show every morning just to get you ready for your day. Give you a little bit of pit talk, pit news, pit whatever is going on, just to get you started on the day, every day, right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. We release this thing about 7 a.m. or so every morning, Monday through Friday. You can subscribe. You see that little button down there. It's kind of buried in the dot com. But if you see that little blue rectangle, it says subscribe. Click that button and you'll be subscribed to our YouTube channel. You can turn on notifications and you'll always know when we release a new morning pit episode it's been a lot of fun this week certainly in the aftermath of the backyard brawl it was a lot of fun last week leading up to the brawl uh we're just i'm having a good time doing these videos it's been really uh fun we've got a lot of great engagement people are you know leaving comments and having a good time i love it when you hit that like button it makes me feel like we uh did a great job here i gotta stop begging i don't want to be one of these guys who begs for youtube likes but i'm kind of begging hit the like button hit the subscribe button that would be big for us. And, of course, stay tuned at pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the Internet, football, basketball, recruiting. And you look over the last week of content at pantherlair.com, we got a ton of stuff there. We got basketball recruiting news. We got football recruiting news. We got tons of coverage of the team coming out of the West Virginia game, uh, film breakdowns, inside the stats, looking at you know all kinds of data about how Pitt did against West Virginia and getting you ready for this game against Tennessee with all kinds of information. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. And you consume that information and that the content that we put out, the articles, the interviews, and the analysis, and you go to the message boards and hang out with other Pitt fans to talk about what's going on in the world of Pitt sports. Uh, it's kind of the, it's, it, it's a one-stop shop. It's got everything you want. It's got the content and it's got the community. So check it out. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. As we sit here, you know, like I said, we release this video in the morning. So we're, you know, probably 30 hours or so from kickoff, depending on when you watch this video, it might be a little bit closer. I'm guessing, I'm guessing we'll be closing in on that 24 hour mark for the 3:30 kickoff tomorrow. At Akershore Stadium, number 17 Pitt, number 24 Tennessee. One of two matchups of ranked opponents in the country this weekend. Florida is hosting Florida, number 12, who jumped from unranked to number 12 by uh, by beating Utah. Florida is hosting Kentucky, who is number 20 in the AP poll. And there's only those are the only two matchups of ranked opponents. This game, this Pitt Tennessee game, is going to be on uh, ABC national television. Are going to be a lot of eyeballs on this thing, and it's one of the premier matchups of the week. And and I say all that as sort of a, a prelude to something I've been thinking about, really, I mean, all week, but certainly since yesterday. You know, on, on yesterday's morning pit, I talked about how big of an opportunity this game is, about what was lying in front of Pitt, what's riding on this game. And I talked about, you know, what they could accomplish with wins, with a win, and what they could still accomplish even if they lose. But the reality is what this game is for Pitt, what it comes down to, it's one word. It's opportunity. Opportunity. They have, no matter what happens tomorrow, an opportunity to match what they did last season. They'll still be able to do that. And it'll still be well within reach. And and I think I would still expect them to do so. You know, I, I, I very much think they're capable of doing what they did last season regardless of what's happened what happens tomorrow but tomorrow's a unique opportunity tomorrow's an opportunity to make a statement really and, and affect the national perception i don't know what the national perception of of pit is right now they're number 17 in the ap poll it's what they were in the preseason poll and then you know the first week poll of the season comes out and they they stand pat at 17 some teams jump them some teams fall behind pit sits at 17 I think there's a, a wait and see approach with this team, which probably a lot of you would say you're taking as well. I'm taking it to some extent, a wait and see approach to, to really find out who they are and who this team is and what they're capable of and what they're ultimately going to accomplish. A wait and see approach. Well, tomorrow is the second half of that equation. All right, we've been doing the wait. Tomorrow we're going to see. And it's not going to tell the whole story of the season tomorrow, good or bad. 
If they win, it's not going to make their season. If they lose, it's not going to break their season. There are 10 more games after tomorrow to write the story of what 2022 is. Story's not going to be written tomorrow. It's one chapter, right? In a 12-chapter book. That's a really corny metaphor, but you understand what I'm saying. No matter what happens tomorrow, the story of the season will continue to be written. And that's good or bad. But what they have an opportunity to, to do tomorrow, more so than last year when they faced Tennessee in Week 2, is to truly make a statement to the, the country. The country. Not just Pitt fans, not just the ACC, not just the region, but the nation. That they really are one of the best teams in the country. Facing two Power 5 non-conference opponents to open the season, including a ranked opponent in Week 2. Granted, both games are at home, but a ranked opponent in Week 2. That's an opportunity. When you snuck out of Akershore Stadium with a win last week, last Thursday in the backyard brawl, it was a tough game. It was an emotional game. It was an intense game. The biggest crowd to ever watch a sporting event in the city of Pittsburgh. The history of the city of Pittsburgh. Well, that's great. You, you were able to play less than your best and come out with a victory. And we, We've talked a lot about that. We talked about it on the post-game show late, late night on Thursday. I guess early Friday morning, if you want to call it that. And we talked about it throughout the week. And I think the players understand that, and I think the coaches understand it. You played less than your best and still came out with a victory. Now it's time to play a little closer to your best. We've talked all week about making those improvements from week one to week two. Well, you need to show it. You need to have those improvements. Because if you do, if you improve in those key areas where maybe you had some shortcomings on Thursday night against West Virginia, the opportunity very much exists to make that statement. Climb in the polls. This will be a game, and we're going to talk about the top 25, the rest of the top 25, particularly the teams right around Pitt and what they have you know, this week and, and what kind of opportunity it might present. But I think if Pitt goes out and beats Tennessee, regardless of what number 16 Arkansas, number 15 Miami, and number 14 Michigan State, number 13 Utah, and maybe even number 12 Florida, maybe even number 11 Oklahoma State, maybe even number 10 USC, regardless of what those teams do, Pitt is going to jump. Now, it might not jump all seven of those teams. You know, USC is playing uh, You know, playing at Stanford. Uh, Oklahoma State has a Power 5 matchup against Arizona State. As I said, Florida is playing number 20, Kentucky. So, you know, if those teams win, they beat Power 5 non-conference opponents, just like you did, or I mean, in the case of Florida and Kentucky, and USC and Stanford, those are conference games. Th- those teams are not going to drop below Pitt, but you have an opportunity to climb at least into the top 15 if not into the top 13, and maybe if things fall your way, maybe the top 12. That's the opportunity that's here. And then create real momentum for yourself to finish out this month against Western Michigan and Rhode Island and head into November or head into October, excuse me, potentially as a top 10 team. Potentially. That's opportunity. And that's the opportunity that sits in front of Pitt tomorrow at Acroshore Stadium. Now, what do they need to do? It's the things we've talked about all week. Receivers need to be sharper. I think Keaton Slovis did play a pretty good game. I think there are areas he needs to improve, just like everybody else, but I think he played a pretty good game. I believe Pat Narduzzi when he says Keaton played well. Better than I thought. That, that's what Pat Narduzzi said, and I tend to agree with him. But Bub Means has to be sharper. Kanate Mumfield, I think he's a pretty sharp route runner, but I think all of those guys need to be sharper in Week 2. And, you know, there's a picture of Bengali Kamara on the screen right there. And the same thing applies, I think, to Kamara that applies to the wide receivers and probably a lot of guys on this team. You know, some of these guys who are maybe in prominent roles for the first time, and maybe even some of the guys who are returning to prominent roles, got a little wake-up call on what it takes to actually play in a game and to win a game. I think there were lessons learned last season about what it takes to win games. And how you can lose games. You know, in in the Western Michigan game, I think they got as many lessons out of the Western Michigan game as they got out of the Virginia game or the Clemson game or the North Carolina game or the Wake Forest game. In those those last games I mentioned, they learned how to win. Or they showed that they were understanding how to win. There were lessons about how to win games from those ones, from those games. With the Western Michigan game, they learned about how to not lose games. Or they learned what it what can cause you to lose a game. And those lessons, maybe they faded a little bit from memory. Maybe they were a little rusty on those lessons. Maybe those, those, those rules and lessons weren't really fresh in their minds when they took the field against West Virginia. And they got reminded of it. And they obviously made the plays at the end of the game to, uh, to pull out the victory. 
but they need those lessons to be very fresh this week. And they need to reflect on that. And ideally they have over the last 10 days or nine days, whatever it's been, eight days. And they understand what they are going to need to do and how they're going to need to approach and how precise that attention to detail is going to need to be for the wide receivers, for the outside linebackers, for the offensive line, for Keaton Slovis, for everybody all around. Now this should be a more I don't want to say a more favorable game, but in some ways, at least in terms of preparation and game plan, this should be a little bit more favorable of a a situation for Pitt than than the West Virginia game was. Um, You know, West Virginia with a brand new offensive coordinator, new quarterback, Pitt wasn't entirely sure what to expect out of West Virginia's offense. They should have a better idea of what Tennessee is going to do. I think all the talk this week of facing Josh Heupel now four times in the last five years, this will be the fourth time in the last five years that Pitt has faced him and faced his teams dating back to the UCF teams in 2018 and 19. I think that does help. I don't know if it necessarily gives you an advantage, but I think it helps in your preparation because you know what to be ready for. And in some respects, you can look at the things that they beat you on last year and, and come up with new approaches on how to stop those things or slow those things down. Now, I've said all week, I, I don't think they're going to stop this offense. I think Tennessee is going to score. And the onus is ultimately going to fall back on the Pitts offense itself. And whether or not they can score and keep up with Tennessee and outscore Tennessee. And that might be a 38-35. That may be 45-42. Maybe it's 31-28, although I'm guessing probably not. But they're going to need to find a way to score with and ultimately outscore Tennessee. And that means it comes down to Keaton Slovis, comes down to those wide receivers. We're not expecting Rodney Hammond to play. I said that early in the week, uh, that we don't expect him to be on the field, which means Izzy Abanacanda is going to have to be better than he was last Thursday night. And and some of that's on the blocking, and some of it's on Izzy himself. But he's going to have to be ready to carry the load and make some big plays, which he did. He made one big play, game-tying touchdown. Well, he's got to, he's going to have to do that for 60 minutes. And then the defense is going to have to, it's, you don't want it to be a feast or famine situation where every drop back is either a sack or a touchdown. But if you're, if it's, if it ends up being that way, you got to make sure that the sacks actually happen. You got to make sure that, you know, you're putting Hendon Hooker in a tough situation so that it's not just all touchdowns so that you get a few drives back for your offense. And then they're going to need they're going to need a turnover or two. I mean, the turnovers were key. Obviously, game sealing interception by MJ Devonshire uh, against West Virginia. Brandon Hill had a huge interception late in the game against Tennessee last year. I mean, you're going to need a player two like that. Maybe that's where Bengali Kam- Kamara comes through with uh, my prediction for him. You know, recording multiple turnovers this year, and and even I think I even predicted he would score multiple defensive touchdowns this season. So Bengali Kamara is going to need to step up. But this would be the type of game where you need to do that because their offense, you know, is likely going to roll. I mean, I think their offense is going to move the ball and probably have a lot of success. And so it's going to flip back on Frank Signetti, Keaton Slovis, and the rest of those guys on that side of the ball to keep up and eventually outpace Hendon Hooker and the Tennessee offense. You know, I think two, two other things on this game. When we talk about the outside linebackers, we talk about Bengali Kamara and Shane Simon, if Tyler Wilts and Solomon DeShields get in there, which Pat Narduzzi said they would, you know, they're going to have some new types of challenges. They, there, there were new things, new challenges out of the West Virginia offense. There are going to be new things and new challenges out of this Tennessee offense, RPOs, and a very wide split offense that's going to spread you out. And it's going to force you to make plays in space. Uh, and give the wide receivers and the tight ends and the running backs opportunities to make plays in space. That's a new kind of challenge that that Kamara and Simon, um, and even though Wilts only played two snaps and DeShields only played a handful of snaps, maybe one snap in the base defense, in addition to playing in the, the third down delta package, those guys didn't see a whole lot of those kinds of things in the West Virginia game. So that's going to be their challenge, is, is adjusting to that. Now, again, there's a lot of experience defending this this system at Pitt. All these Pitt coaches have a lot of experience with it, but they've got to be able to get the message across to the players in a way that the players can absorb it and ultimately execute it. That's going to be a challenge. And then the last thing, I think the defensive line needs to step up. They, you know, John Morgan had a monster game. Kalaji Kansi probably had a better game than I think we thought as you were watching it. He ends up with a handful of tackles. I think he's going to have to step up. Um, But across the board, I think you're going to need 
big plays from John Morgan, from Haba uh, Baldonado, uh, from Kalijah Kansi, Dayon Hayes. These guys are going to have to step up and make some big plays, some splash plays. They're going to have to get after Hooker in the backfield. He can run. He can get out and go, and that's something you're going to have to watch out for. You don't want to lose contain on Hendon Hooker because he can run with the ball, but you're going to have to get to him, and you're going to have to get some sacks, and you're going to you know try and get that ball out. It, it, I, I really feel like it's going to be that kind of game where it's, I think it's just going to be wild. And it's going to it's gonna be about, you know, can you get that extra turnover? Can you avoid avoid those turnovers on offense? And can you get that extra turnover on defense? Um, because, you know, I don't know if you can reliably, I, I don't know if you can count on consistently stopping this offense and forcing them into a lot of punts. I'm just, I'm just not sure it's going to be that kind of game. Now, historically, I'm always wrong about these kinds of things. I might be wrong about this. There might be, you know, 18, 19 punts in this game or 16 or 17 punts in this game from the two teams combined. Maybe that's how it ends up being. My guess is that's not the case. My guess is Pitt moves the ball pretty well and Tennessee does too. And it comes down to either which team can convert more drives into touchdowns as opposed to settling for field goals or it comes down to that key turnover or two, uh, particularly in the second half, that can that ultimately makes the difference. However it goes down, it's a huge opportunity. And it's a huge opportunity for Pitt on the national spectrum, but it's also a huge opportunity uh, in terms of recruiting. You know, I mean, there, there were some good prospects at the game last Thursday night, the backyard brawl, but it was tough. It was a Thursday night, first week of school for a lot of schools all over the place. So not a lot of kids could come in. There were a handful of local guys. Uh, Pitt commit Lamar Seymour came in from Florida. This week's going to have a good group. This week is going to have an impressive collection of recruits on the sideline. And the top name, the one that everybody knows, the one everybody's going to be watching, is Hakeem Williams. Five-star wide receiver from Stranahan, Florida, I think the Miami area. Number 16 overall prospect in the class of 2023. Number four wide receiver. This is, this is rarefied air. This is the upper stratosphere of prospects. These, this is the kind of kid who goes to those top five or ten schools in the country. And Pitt is very much in the mix for him. Now, we've talked a lot about Hakeem Williams on the Panther Lair show. We talked about it on the weekend recap through the summer. Just to bring you up to speed. Five-star wide receiver, one of the top wide receivers in the country, was seriously looking at Rutgers. Strongly considering Rutgers. And the reason he was strongly considering Rutgers is because Taekwon Underwood was there and had a relationship with Hakeem Williams. Had a strong bond built with Hakeem Williams. Underwood leaves Rutgers and goes to Pitt. That bond carries over. Williams is no longer looking at Rutgers. Now he's considering Pitt. And he's considering Pitt enough that he takes an unofficial visit in the spring to see the Panthers. Now, unofficial visit means he's coming on his own dime. So he paid to fly from Florida, stay in a hotel, and check out what Pitt has to offer. He comes back in June for an official visit. And the official visit, Pitt pays his way and pays for his hotel and room and boarding and food and all that stuff. And they roll out the red carpet, and he has a great time, and Pitt is one of his top schools. The only other school he took an official visit to in June was Georgia. Now, since then, Georgia has picked up some more wide receivers, probably out of the mix. However, Florida State is in the mix. Early in August, Hakeem Williams took an unofficial visit to see Florida State, was really impressed, and went out to Louisiana this past weekend, went to New Orleans to watch the Florida State LSU game at the Superdome. Now, he couldn't interact with the coaches from Florida State, because it's off campus and this is not a, a period uh, in the recruiting calendar where you're allowed to have in-person contact off campus. And so he didn't do that, but he wanted to go see Florida State in action. And he's talked about wanting to see teams see how they do and how they perform and how they are on the field. And he obviously got to a pretty impressive showing from Florida State against LSU. He's coming to Pitt this weekend. And so we talk about implications, we talk about opportunities, we talk about the, you know making a statement. Here's an opportunity to show Hakeem Williams what Pitt can do with this new offense and the quarterback and all these things. So that's on the table. Florida State continues to be one of the main threats for Hakeem Williams. And he, he has talked about how he wants to take an official visit to Florida State later in the, the fall, maybe early winter. Texas A&M is also in the mix for an official visit. And I think Texas A&M has a well-earned reputation for making the most of the NIL rules. And so that's going to be something in play there as well. Hakeem Williams has said he's going to announce his commitment at the end of September. I think the 23rd is the date that he's put out there. Obviously, that commitment is not going to be rock solid since he's intending to take further official visits. But Pitt is right in the hunt here. 
And it's the strength of the relationship with Taekwon Underwood. That's why he's looking at Pitt. Well, I should amend that. That's why he initially came on a visit to Pitt. Since then, he's formed relationships with the other coaches on the staff, like Charlie Partridge and Pat Narduzzi. And he has really enjoyed what he has seen out of Pitt on the visits. And I think they are serious contenders, probably more than most national people give them credit for, even though Florida State is considered to be the school that's really rising in his recruitment. But that's the biggest one this weekend. And getting him, again, he's coming up on his own dime. He's coming up to see Pitt in person and pay money out of his pocket to do so. That's huge. And so you talk about implications for this game, that's a big one. They're also going to have another five-star wide receiver, Ryan Wingo, five-star wide receiver in the class of 2024. And those are guys who are juniors in high school right now. He's from St. Louis. He's coming into town to watch Pitt in action, another big-time prospect there. Jacob Odin, a four-star safety in the 2024 class. He's from Michigan. He's coming in. Um, Colin Cubbery, a three-star offensive lineman who is the number one prospect in the state of New York for the class of 2024. He's going to be at the game. And speaking of big-time wide receivers, Marcus Harris, unrated right now, will likely be a four-star prospect, if not a five-star prospect, at Mater D uh, High School in, in California. And he's in the class of 2025. So this is a guy who's a sophomore in high school. He's got a bunch of offers right now. Georgia, Auburn, uh, uh, Michigan, and Pitt among them. And he's taking an unofficial visit. He's flying in from California to watch Pitt play Tennessee on Saturday. That's big time. That's big time because you watch his film. I mean, he's a big time prospect and he's not ranked yet because they haven't put the stars on the 2025 class yet. These guys who were sophomores in high school just quite yet, but he's going to be a high ranked prospect. He's going to be a four or five star recruit and that's huge. Uh, I don't have to, I don't have to explain why it's huge to have a guy like him on campus. So that's a, that's what five of the recruits who are going to be visiting. There are going to be more guys on the sidelines. We'll have more reports at pantherlair.com. But Jeff Capel is going to have some guys there as well. Jalen Lowe, a four-star shooting guard from Texas, is going to be on his official visit, which uh, you know is a big deal. He's in the class of 2023, so he's going to sign a letter of intent and be a freshman next year. The official visit is really the opportunity for the coaches to impress the recruit and show him why he wants to go to that school. And so that's a huge uh, a huge one for Jeff Capel, as well as Dell Jones, a four-star point guard in the 2024 recruiting class, and Thomas Sorber, a three-star center out of Philadelphia in the 2024 recruiting class. I mean, Capel is going to have a couple other guys in town as well, but Lowe, Jones, and Sorber are three big names to know for Jeff Capel this weekend. And so everybody's trying to do some recruiting events with this game against Tennessee. The football team has to hold up its end and put on a good show in front of what should be a pretty decent crowd. All right, the last thing we want to do, and we'll probably do this every Friday just to kind of keep you posted on everything, we'll go around the Coastal and around the top 25, what the other teams in the Coastal are doing this weekend, what they're playing, and then the games you want to keep an eye on in terms of the rankings right now. If Pitt takes care of business, what other games are going to have an impact on Pitt's ranking and how far they could potentially climb? Around the Coastal, there's not a lot that you're going to get excited about. Miami's hosting Southern Miss. Duke is playing at Northwestern, which actually I think is part of a home-and-home, and, home, and I believe Duke won last year. I think Northwestern went to uh, um, Durham, and Duke won that game. Duke off to a, a decent start after beating Temple last week, and you know who knows? Maybe Duke's uh, build, building something there. Um, North Carolina is at Georgia State, which is an interesting road game. We talk about these ACC teams, or we talk about why does Pitt play at Western Michigan, play at this, play at that. Everybody plays these games. You can't afford to just buy all of your opponents, all of your non-conference opponents who are outside of the Power Five. At certain points, you're going to have to do home-and-home deals with non-Power Five, non-conference opponents. You know, Pitt has the deal with Western Michigan. Um, They had a deal with Marshall a few years ago. They ended up buying their way out of the return trip to Marshall. Marshall was here in 2016. They bought their way out of the return trip to Marshall. Um, you know, you go back over the years. I mean, Cincinnati, really, this upcoming Cincinnati series was agreed to before Cincinnati was about to join the Big 12. So, I mean, that was put in contract as a uh, non-Power 5, uh, you know, non-conference home-and-home home deal. It'd be interesting to see if that... Um, if there's still, if Pitt, it would be interesting to see if Pitt has to pay Cincinnati to come, uh, even though Cincinnati would be in the Big 12. Uh, my point is this everybody has to do this every now and then. 
Um, everybody, because you pay a lot of money for you know Rhode Island to come to Pittsburgh or U- UMass to come to Pittsburgh last year, New Hampshire to come to Pittsburgh. I mean, this this costs six figures. Uh, it, because some of these smaller schools rely on these kind of buy games as you know to supplement a significant portion of their athletic department budget, and so you know you do that, but you also can't afford to do that multiple times every year. I don't think anybody wants Pitt to play. I mean, you might want to see it uh, for entertainment value, but most people, on, in terms of competitive balance and and what you want to achieve in the season in terms of win totals, you don't want to see Pitt play multiple Power Five non conference opponents. The ideal schedule is one Power Five team, two you know group of five teams, and an FCS team. That's your ideal four game non conference schedule. Well, if you're going to do that, even if you don't pay the Power Five team, you can't afford to pay the other three teams six figures every year. And so you're going to have to agree to home and homes every now and then. North Carolina going to Georgia State this weekend. Virginia's at Illinois in the Big Ten. Georgia Tech going to Western Carolina. Another or no, Georgia Tech's hosting Western Carolina. Sorry, I misread that. Um, Virginia Tech, ACC game here against Boston College. Uh, both teams are 0-1. Virginia Tech lost to Old Dominion. Boston College lost to Rutgers. That stinks for both. Somebody has to win this game. Good luck to whoever. That game's in Blacksburg, so maybe Virginia Tech wins. I don't know if location matters in that situation. And then Syracuse is going to play at Connecticut. We'll include Syracuse since they're uh, one of Pitt's annual uh, opponents. I guess we can include Louisville as well. But uh, we're really looking at Syracuse at Connecticut. Dig this. Syracuse is minus 23 and a half. Now, I'd, I'd have to go look. This is completely a guess off the top of my head, but I can't imagine the last time Pitt was, or Syracuse was, you know, favored by more than 20 against an FBS opponent. Minus 23 and a half on the road, nonetheless. All right, top 25 watch teams around Pitt. Pitt is number 17 right now, as you know. Uh, right ahead of them number at, uh, is number 16, Arkansas. They're going to be hosting South Carolina in an SEC matchup. So keep an eye on that. Number 15, Miami, we mentioned, is hosting Southern Miss. Um, number 14, Michigan State, has Akron coming to town. Number 13, Utah, is hosting Southern Utah. Number 12, really probably you know the other most compelling game of the week in terms of having two ranked opponents. Number 12, Florida, is hosting number 20, Kentucky. Number 11, Oklahoma State, has uh, Arizona State coming to town. And then number 10, USC, is playing at Stanford in a Pac-12 game. So, I mean, you look down that list, like, all right, you got a, a an SEC game in Arkansas, South Carolina, the number 16 team. But then you have Miami Southern Miss, Michigan State Akron, and Utah Southern Utah. If Pitt beats Tennessee, I don't know if they would jump Arkansas if Arkansas beats South Carolina. You know, they win a conference game, Pitt, you know, it's 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 a power five opponent. But conceivably, you know, I mean, could Pitt and Arkansas, if both teams win, or either one of them, could they jump Miami, Michigan State, Utah because none of those three teams are playing a Power 5 opponent? They're playing Southern Miss, Akron, and Southern Utah, respectively. I'm not sure. Maybe. You know what I mean? I, I think it's possible. And then, you know, you get up into Florida, Oklahoma State, USC. They're all playing Power 5 opponents, two of them playing conference games. A loss, presumably, would drop them. Now, maybe Florida, maybe the chalk all holds, and those teams aren't even a candidate to lose, but it's something to watch. I think those are the seven games to keep an eye on this week, you know, ranked numbers 16 through 10, as potentially being teams that Pitt could jump over their, over if the Panthers win. Now, if any of those three that I mentioned, Miami, Michigan State, Utah, lose to their non-Power 5 opponent and Pitt wins, that's a guaranteed jump. Beyond that, if everybody wins, you know, and, and most of the chalk holds here, it's going to be... Uh, you know, it's going to be a beauty pageant. It's going to be the looks test and who had the prettiest win. And uh, I don't know if a game like last week is enough to do it for Pitt, but I would have to think if they beat a ranked opponent, even it looks if it looks exactly like last week's game, I got to think that bumps them into the top 15. Somebody somebody drops just for the strength of schedule. You know what I mean? You know, hey, Llama, how about something for the effort, right? All right. That is it for us today. Well, like I say, we are, depending on when you watch this video, somewhere around the 24-hour mark until kickoff. I can't wait for this one. I was excited for the Backyard Brawl. I'm excited for this game for totally different reasons. Curiosity is killing the cat over here. I, I, I'm really, really interested to see what this team looks like, what they're able to do after a week of preparation, after a week of correcting the errors from last week, as 
Sam Vanderhaar going to have it all figured out? Is Ben Sauls, who's on the screen right there, going to keep up his strong kicking from last week? And most importantly, what's going to happen with Keaton Slovis, wide receivers, Izzy Abanacanda in that offensive line? Got to score. Score, score, score. You got to go into that game, and I said this yesterday, you got to go into that game looking for 40 plus. I mean, your sights have to be set on topping 40. And maybe you won't need it. Maybe you win 40 to 17 or something like that, but you need to shoot for 40. So we'll see what happens. Remember, after the game tomorrow night, we will be live. We'll have our live Panther Lair post game show probably around 10 o'clock. Not entirely sure when. Hit that subscribe button down there in the lower uh, right hand corner of the screen. You see it's it's a blue rectangle right there on top of the dot com. Click that and then turn on your notifications, and you will get a, a, a notification when we go live tomorrow night. We'd love to have you for the post game show. Win or lose, it's going to be fun. We had a lot of people online last week, last Thursday night at like two in the morning. Can't wait to see what we get after this game. It's going to be, it's going to be something. I, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be something. So thanks for watching this week of Morning Pit. It's been a lot of fun this week. Can't wait to do it again next week. But before that happens, we will talk to you live for the Panther Lair Post Game Show after Pitt, Tennessee tomorrow right here on youtube.com slash